So I could um, spend a lot of time talking about uh, Marianne's bio, but um, she's, uh, she's, she's so accomplished and so wonderful. One thing that I know she's very proud of, which is a recent award she's gotten, uh, it's called the Christopher Columbus Award for Intellectual Discovery, uh, which she received for her work around global literacy, not only in Ethiopia and Uganda, South Africa, India, but also here in the rural US. Please give a warm round of applause for tonight's wonderful speaker, Mary Ann Wolf. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kazus, for everything that you've done for all of us. Thank you, Alexander, Rose, and Michael, who's been just a wonderful, you, you've been my Beatrice. <laughs> thank you, and Andrew and Catherine, wherever you are, thank you so much. Well, we are going to take a very quick journey through the human reading brain together. Um, I am always one of a group. I never do anything without even at least one 30-second thank you to all the people who do this work. These are people who are in genetics, they're in neuroscience, they're in education, they're in linguistics. All of us work together to bring um, the information I will be showing you today, tonight. Now, it's going to be kind of like three stories, three short stories. One of them, however, is more like a grim fairy tale. And you will see it is in the middle. There are things that I will say to you that will make some of you very uncomfortable. I hope you remember what St. Thomas Aquinas said when people disagreed with him. Iron sharpens iron. So at the end of my talk, please, I'm willing to be sharpened. <laughs> so, but not until, actually. Um, <laughs> um, the talk will have three parts. Um, I will spend about 20 minutes or so introducing the reading brain to you and the implications which are very serious for children's development and for children who, and adults who have a different brain organization, which is dyslexia. We'll be talking then about the grim fairy tale, about what this information has to say about us and our changes as we move ever more ineluctably into a digital culture that will change and has already changed us all. Finally, I'll be talking about one of the most incredibly important uses of technology in our work, and that's our work in global literacy. So, the first thing I want to say is absolutely nothing, nothing is unaltered when we learn in our brain. So when people ever say, this changes your brain, duh, <laughs> everything changes our brain that we are learning. But there are changes that are very important to understand in cultural inventions. Literacy and numeracy were never part of our genetic heritage. They are things that we learned, and how we are learning about them comes from a variety of knowledge bases. And I will be pulling many of them together, but especially these latter areas. Um, but it's a mystery still to all of us. How did any of us ever learn to read if there's no genes and there's no structures that are specific? How did we do this? Well, the answers give us a window into how extraordinary it is that we have this brain that literally goes beyond itself. And now I'm going to ask a member of the audience whom I primed beforehand. He's hiding. He is in the furthest spot imaginable. <laughs> Alexander, however, has an exposed prefrontal cortex. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's wonderfully handy for me to use <laughs> to demonstrate a little just about, you. just for me, Alexander, <laughs> thank you so much. We don't know each other, but it's very familiar to touch a man's brain, but I'm gonna do it in public. <laughs> But what I want to show you is that we have no circuits that are connected to reading. But what we do is we take areas of the brain that were made to do things that we do genetically have. Our ability to recognize faces, objects, these are all taking place here. 
And what we are doing with reading is we are making totally new connections with areas of the language here and here, as you see what Otto did. So all of these areas that were not connected are now connected in a terribly intricate, beautiful circuit. But Alexander is very tall, but I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> this is what we do very quickly. We put all these processes for words. But when Alexander's brain begins to have insights and reads totally, the entire circuit on both sides is actually functioning. Thank you so much. You're, you're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But there are two other aspects. So the first principle in how we learn to do anything like numeracy and literacy, we can make these totally new connections to make a new circuit. But we can also do something extraordinarily clever. We can take neurons that were originally made for aspects of vision, and we can repurpose them. We can, in fact, recycle areas of our brain. And if you remember Alexander's brain that I pointed to first, that fusiform gyrus area is what we used and our ancestors used to be sure that they could recognize things inst almost instantaneously. And so what we are doing in reading is we are recycling some of our older parts, but we are doing them within the limits that were already there. So my colleague Stanislas Dehaan uses the term neuronal niche. If you look at all the writing systems in the world and you would analyze them, which people have done, what you see is that so many of them rely on features from nature. So we are using neurons in our visual system that are actually in this niche that they were used before, but they are being expanded. Now, this is a kind of a little joke. There are very few jokes that cognitive neuroscientists make, so this is just your only chance, practically. These are the first tablets. That... <laughs> Please, it's so bad, I'm telling you. <laughs> These Sumerians, probably Sumerians, but we really think also the Egyptians may well have been the first. But they began this wonderful, completely new invention of putting together symbols that would characterize our words. Now, the alphabetic system is really one of the most interesting cognitively. And for those of you who want to ask me questions later, please do. But it is, it's far more cognitively intricate than most people realize. But I have to whisk you into this next slide because I want to give you the idea, the concept that our brain is plastic. The reading brain doesn't exist. It's created. And what you see here in English is a motley overview of the circuitry there, Chinese, kanji, Japanese kana. Anyone here who speaks or writes Japanese? Ah, you have the most interesting brain in the room, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> that brain is actually using two different, actually more than two, but two circuit that you see one for kana and one like Chinese for kanji. Now, very quickly, what do you see immediately in kanji that's different from English? Immediately. You are not the most immediate audience I've ever seen. <laughs> the concept here is that a logographic, actually, it's a logo syllabary, it's going to need much more visual memory and putting symbols and meanings. So what you see here is that visual system in the right hemisphere it requires far more space, if you will, cortical space. And here's the principle. The writing system will rearrange, make the particulars of that circuitry. So your circuitry is actually going to be influenced by the writing system. But that same plasticity, and here I'm forecasting, that same plasticity will make us change as we use different mediums as well. Here's the important principle for us to think about. What we do when we read makes a difference in the circuit itself. The brain reflects the cognitive, perceptual, and linguistic requirements of it. 
that brain is changing as we speak under our fingertips. Don't ask me about babies and teaching them to read at 18 months. That's a question that you want to not ask me. I have opinions, however. <laughs> there are, I use this to simply state that every child has to begin anew. If we don't have genes, if we don't have structures just for reading, every circuit is new, it's fresh. Now, there are many implications for that. Now, my colleagues and I who work at uh, Tufts and MIT, this is our imaging center where we have a child imaging center, we are studying what happens before, during, and after reading acquisition, and we're studying what does the brain need. Now, this is a real story that has both good and bad parts in it, but I'm going to just highlight a few. Orthography matters. The child who does not have exposure to print and all the things that go into the colorful world of pre-literacy, that is a different brain. The child who does not hear words, and we are working in rural parts of the United States where some of our children have 400 words only around three and four years of age. This is unconscionable, but that is going to change that brain. Now, many people ask me about, is spelling necessary? I'm just going to give you one little <laughs> slide from Boston. Lexington, Massachusetts, to describe what I think about why spelling is necessary. <laughs> I can always tell when you hit legs straight up. <laughs> I simply want you to know that spelling makes representations. Those representations are part of that brain. All the words you know, they're part of that brain. And so when we look, and I need you to look at this slide. This is 1995, and what, I, what it just kills my soul is that the data are basically the same to almost 20 years later. What we have are children who are you know, well, have a beautiful life, very privileged a working class and a welfare system family. Now, the last thing I want you to translate this side is economics equals words. You and I know that it's absolutely not true. But you and I also know that children who are with parents who have two jobs who can barely summon enough time at the end of the day to talk are getting less instances of words. The reality is that they can get 32 million less words heard that are represented in that brain. Now, you and I have all the privileges in the world. What do we do about a situation that could be so simply solved if we put our minds to it? This will be one of several questions that I ask this audience. But now I have to put it all together. This brain here, this series of brains, shows you just a motley fashion what Otto is doing in the first 300 to 400 milliseconds when you read. You are putting together orthographic information. You're putting linguistic information, semantic, syntactic, phonological. You're putting it all together in about three to 400 milliseconds. You are primed to understand that word. But just if you remember Alexander's brain when I pushed the borders over to his right hemisphere, when we go beyond just that recognition, we are doing something almost miraculous. We are putting together extraordinary, just, and we're talking about 100 to 200, sometimes even 300 milliseconds, we're putting together all of this cognitive stuff that goes into what I will be calling deep reading in a minute. But what I want you to think about is that what we are doing is not unlike, and I look at Ryan, my English PhD, we are doing exactly what Proust had 
said in this tiny little book called On Reading, which nobody reads, interestingly, terribly, he said it better than any teacher, neuroscientist, or linguist, that what we do when we read is that we go to the end of the wisdom of the author and move into our own. This is my prefatory way of talking about what I am calling deep reading skills. It's essential for you in this tiny moment with me to recognize what you do. When you move from three to 400 milliseconds, and if we're in evoke potential territory, those of you in psychology, this is the N400 moment. This is the moment when you pull together what you know about the word with what you know from the world, you put your perspective of other, your perspective taking your imagery, and then you move through analogy to inferential processes. These processes make you think completely differently. You are, for all purposes, Hercule Poirot. You are Sherlock, you are Miss Marple, but you are doing something to that information that changes it. And from that change comes critical analysis, and very, very importantly, if we are lucky, if you know to allocate time, this is unconscious, but this is if, if we are trained to do this, we move into Proust territory, where we move into our own, if you will, global neuronal workspace, where we think beyond the author and we generate new thoughts. This is, an, this is like the revolution in our brain. This is what we want all our children, regardless of medium, all our children to do, to go beyond the wisdom. Now, Alberto Manguel has wonderful, wonderful things to say about background knowledge, but I chose this quote to give you just a sense of two processes, two of the deep reading processes, and this being background knowledge. Reading is cumulative and proceeds with geometric progression. Each new reading builds upon what the reader has read before. Think about this. You are what you read. And Joseph Epstein, so many people say it in different ways. But I will say, that's what your brain is doing. That's what you are putting together. And right next door, you are putting together perspective taking. And I want to give you the tiniest exercise into your own reading, just for one minute, not even a minute. Hemingway was asked to write a story in six words. It was a bet. Do you know this, Ryan? The bet. Can you write a short story in six words? And he did it. Now, it is a serious one. So I don't want, I mean, because you're going to be primed to laugh. Don't. I want you to, yeah, well, you can laugh later, but not now. I want you to just neutral, now think. Okay. This is what he said was his finest piece of writing. It is imagery. It is imagery like none other. It is perspective taking, and it's gut-wrenching use of affect. This is an extraordinary use. This is what I did this year. <laughs> Don't even bother to, to try to glance at it. Just glance. This is just one piece of what we do. Another way of looking at it is this. We are constantly elaborating this circuitry by what we read, by what we feel, by what we think. Then, I have to turn you with a, like a 180 cerebral turnaround. What about people who don't read in that same way that we've just been talking? And I'm only going to be able to talk three minutes about this, despite the fact it's occupied 20 years of my life. <laughs> Who's counting? This is a story like few others that the reading brain gives us insight to. You see, the reading brain is just so brand new. 
your brains, they're 40, 50,000 years old. That dyslexic brain is not about reading. Reading disadvantaged it, but it is one of the most beautiful brains the species had, and it has, and it's been there for a purpose. It is part of what we might call neuro or cerebral diversity in which we need different brain organizations. So from my standpoint, this work that we've done over the years in, in looking at the differences, and here you can just very quickly see there's a complete difference in the time in which information goes instead of from the right hemisphere at the top just to the left, the right hemisphere is processing like crazy. Not for everyone, but for many. This is part of its strength in the rest of life. It's what makes people artists and architects. And probably if I could do a gene study of Silicon Valley, I will bet you the propensity of dyslexia is greater here than anywhere in the country, except maybe MIT. But <laughs> I will also say I study this not simply as a researcher, but as a mother. <laughs> This is my first son, and he is a dyslexic artist. One of the best uses of that brain one can ever have. I will talk about my other son a little later. <laughs> He's in the audience. <laughs> all to say, when we put all this information together, we can do things differently when we think about children, how can we use these kinds of information? How can we build interventions? And that's what we're doing. We are reverse engineering the reading brain to build ever better interventions that tackle literally the circuit, that address the parts of the circuit. So I'm not going to tell you more than 30 seconds, but we're built, we built this one program called Inter well, Ravo Intervention, but all of the characters, just to give you the quickest little blip of it, all the characters represent a piece of the circuit or a strategy. So this wonderful woman, or <laughs> spider, Ms. Mim, stands for many interesting meetings. For those of you in linguistics, it's polysemy. She's teaching polysemy. She's teaching how words work. This is just one slender look at what I want you to know about the implications. Many of my talks are all about the implications. But this talk, this talk has to go into an area that makes, is going to make some of you uncomfortable with me. And that's just fine. <laughs> I need to talk to you about the implications, not for intervention as such, but for thinking about what we all are doing as we change after 8 to 12 hours on the screen. You and I know you at least are at least similar to me in that you are on the screen reading, and the characteristics of the screen are different. Now, one of the first questions is, you know now we have a very plastic circuit that reflects what's asked of it. What are the implications inside a milieu that emphasizes speed, immediacy, multitasking, continuous partial attention? So the question becomes whether the affordances of reading on screen will lead us to a new, a very different reading brain, one in which text length text complexity, density of thought, density of syntax, and the reader's memory and attention are changing, are challenging. Here is a piece of the cognitive evidence, if you will. And part of my work is to really try to understand what those changes are from every standpoint. Um, from the standpoint just of reading behavior, think to yourself. Skimming is the new way to read. We zigzag. You word spot. You browse. You graze. You are not reading in the same linear ways that we have done before. Average attention span looks about half of what it was with implications for memory. 
So studies on memory, and that's what, of course, you consolidate when you allocate time to it, memory seems to be diminishing by about half as well. Now, what are some of the sources of that? Do you know how many times our youth between, well, let's just say 20, are distracted in a given hour? 27. 27 times, and I'm not looking at anybody in particular. This is not a damnation. This is just a fact. Most of our children and youth are basically using multiple digital devices, and they are multitasking. That's a whole set of questions I'm happy to answer. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Whole lot of interesting mixed research on multitasking. But by and large, they're moving like moving like this way. Now, it's one thing for us who have formed reading brains. It is another thing for our young who are distracted. What are the implications for them? And I will certainly say this is not just for them. The decreased focus attention is in us as well. And that's a very big story that some of you might want to probe with me afterwards. But some of the interesting things that, in fact, last week I did one program on NPR in which the, the announcer was saying, my reading has changed. My experience of reading has changed. My ability to immerse myself in reading has changed. What are the factors? And there are many that go into those changes. But with well, please forgive me, but I'm so much less interested in you than I am the kids. And the reason is because they don't have an already formed reading circuitry. So the question becomes developmentally, will changes in attention, multitasking, the sense of immediate access to external information, not their own, external information, will that change the formation of what I'm talking about? about when I say deep reading. Well, in an essence, short circuit us, short circuit our next generation. So the deep reading brain for you requires that you allocate time, requires that you use that neuronal workspace when you read. And I'm not talking about all the time. All of us, when we do email, we are absolutely, of course we have to scan it. But the reality is there is much reading that we are bleeding into with that same mode of reading. So on the one hand, I'm worried about adults not allocating what they could. But more importantly, it takes years of formation for, for kids to develop all of those deep reading processes. This is not, this is, this is not casual. This is the essence of critical thinking. My colleague at MIT, Sherry Turkle, said this. We transgress not because we try to build the new, but because we do not allow ourselves to consider what it disrupts or diminishes. That's really the point. That's why I dare to come into a technology-driven cafe and say outrageous things. I need to be sure we all have a kind of cerebral pause to think about, are we changing? Will our children change? What will be lost? What will be disrupted? But I am not saying that we can go back. I am, this is no binary message. We cannot go back, but I'd also suggest that we should not simply lurch forward to the next new thing, the next new thing but rather ask the question, what must we preserve that is essential? And what must we acquire to gain what is necessary for the 21st century child? Patricia Greenfield, a colleague at UCLA, said something that is just so simple and so right. No one medium can do everything. Every medium has its costs and weaknesses. Every medium develops some cognitive skills at the expense of others. Although the digital medium may develop impressive visual intelligence, I would say far more than that, the cost seems to be deep processing, mindful knowledge acquisition, inductive analysis, critical thinking, and reflection. Deep reading. That's what that's, she, she hasn't read my work when she wrote that. 
this is a threat. This is a threat to all of us to think that we could just be in the middle of what seems so extraordinary and so expansive. There are always going to be things lost unless, at this moment of time, we can use the system to redress its own weaknesses. And so the questions I'm asking with colleagues like Catherine Isbister, who's going to university, uh, who was at NYU, Fox Harrell, who was here at MIT, he's at MIT, I'm asking whether we can devise digital learning systems that address issues in attention, that address these deep reading processes, that address inference from the start. So I am asking whether we can think as a group, and you are the people who are going to think more than I. I am going to bring my particular, very selective piece of knowledge. And the people in this room, what you represent, you need to do the work that goes beyond what I have done or what our group is doing in neuroscience. We need to ask whether we can help develop a biliterate or a multi-literate brain so that children literally know and have formed the kinds of brain and the kinds of intelligences that you have, and plural is the word, and know when to use what and know how. Because Learning to read digitally is not exactly what I am talking about for our children. There are so many aspects to really learning to read digitally in, the deep, in a deep reading sense. And so I bring you to my last 10 minutes together. Michael will be shocked that I'm right on time. <laughs> the third story is a completely different one. I'm asking you for another cerebral move or maneuver. Can we take this information about the plasticity of the reading brain? Can we use it to aid ourselves, to aid our own transition, to aid the transition of our children? And very important to those of us who really understand that literally fundamentally changes our brain, fundamentally, can we take this knowledge in connection with technology's extraordinary potential for democratization of knowledge? Can we use it to attack global literacy? And so I'm going to use my last nine minutes to introduce you to a project that I'm doing with my colleagues at MIT and Georgia State University. And these are my kids, if you will, in rural it's not even, we can't even use the word rural, in the most remote region of Ethiopia. There is no electricity. All you see there is the light from the tablet. And we who are in this area have been struggling for many years with the fact that about 57 to 70 million children have no schools. They will never become literate. There is nothing that is even close to that in their lives. That's 57. Another 150 to 200 million are functionally not ever going to be literate. That's 200 to 250 million children. What is it that we could do with our knowledge bases at this moment in time when so many things have changed, even in the three years that since we've begun this project. So our question became, can we create a, an experience on a tablet that can help children learn to read on their own without teachers, no matter how remote the place is? And so our approach, which is really taking our understanding of the reading brain and hooking it to big data analytics, to technology, to child-driven learning, to see whether we can take it to places like Oh, I should show you. Places like Ethiopia, Uganda, South Africa, where we're on places where there are 60 to 100 children in a classroom. So we're in places with no schools and we're places with, with schools. And our approach was really just a very, um, it's a simple concept and a very difficult one to implement. We take our information about the reading brain circuit and we are trying to make an app map. We've made the map, 
But what we're now doing, we're working with developers, we're working with all kinds of people interested in making apps that go after each part of that circuit. So that just as we did in our intervention with strategies that a teacher can do, we're taking apps and seeing whether we can create this experience which will address those parts of the circuit and have the children learn to read on their own. That's the concept, and we're, you know, that's a really difficult one. This little boy received his tablet, and I have to, I have to tell you this story. He is, in my opinion, a prodigy. We went to the village with Motorola Zooms. Do you remember, this was three years ago, do you remember the Motorola Zoom? This big, clunky thing, very robust, good with dirt falling off cliffs. <laughs> but it was so difficult to turn on. I will admit, and those in the front row know this to be true, it took me about 20, 25 minutes to turn it on, you really get it to the right. I was terribly embarrassed, nobody knew. I tell everybody now because what happened then is so wonderfully embarrassing. When the tablets were distributed, this little boy took it. Now remember, there's no electricity, there's nothing. They've never seen a, they, I, they have seen a cell phone, but that's it. He takes this little Motorola Zoom, and four minutes he gets it on <laughs> and says, I got mine on, I'm the lion. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is. He is our lion prince, and within one hour, this little boy had taught all the kids in the village how to use the tablet. So by one week, most of the apps were used. By one month, now we're talking over 300 apps, PBS helped us, you know, with videos and eBooks. over 300 things were already turned on. By five months, this lion prince now, how is that possible? He did it. He did it. And it ruined, oh, you cannot believe it, drained the batteries. I mean, it was all solar power. It was a mess. But the reality is these children, first hurdle, computer literacy, zoom within one day. Second hurdle, third hurdle, fourth hurdles, we're working on them every day. Language, concepts, pre-literacy, precursors, but I want to show you what happened in terms of my first trip over there to do behavioral data. And I want to show you one thing, and for those of you, any, is anyone a teacher here? Anyone a teacher? This was like watching the first school. The Lion Prince and then the older girls took over. They they drilled. <laughs> it was hysterical. Everybody yells and screams about drilling. These girls drilled successfully. <laughs> and the result was they, they're, they're absolutely, you cannot give them a letter. Now, remember, they have no instruments. So they take sticks and they make the letters in the dirt. They work with anything that's in their environment. And they have learned all of their letters. They can do the alphabet backwards and forwards. Andrew, where are you? She does not read. She does sight word recognition. This is not the same. We are at the cusp with the teachers, but they, we, we truly think that with just a little more work, that we will get the apps to a place, that the kids could get to a place where they can really learn how to read. And then for us, the big step will be getting them all kinds of materials so that reading and numeracy and reading can be used to develop STEM skills and other forms of learning. So that will be our overall goal. We're now in various parts of Ethiopia, Uganda, India, 
these are all small, small sites, each one different. Bangladesh is with cell phones. The others are all tablets. And then we have come to our own backyards. This is where our children in rural Georgia and Alabama have shown us a side of the United States, which is really tough to see. These are our kids. They are, they are being wasted. And technology in this particular part of our world has proven an enormous resource. There's an article in Smithsonian last fall on this, if some of you would like to read it. The reporter said he had never seen poverty like this. This is us. This is all together us. But these children are learning a great deal, and we're very, very much readied, if you will, to go wherever we need to to see if, how the uses can be spread and, and used by all kinds of children. This is our latest one in Bangladesh. And I use it there just to, to give you one extra piece of information. The UN Millennium Goals will not be met. But they have taught us that if we could reduce illiteracy by 120 million people, we could reduce world poverty by 12%. Some of you have been reading what Pope Francis' message of late has been. It's a simple one. If we can help solve poverty in our world, we will change it. We'll change it for everyone. It's not a religious message. It is a spiritual one, but in the deepest meaning of spirituality. It's that which we can do by putting our knowledge together. And of course, for those of you who want to argue with me, <laughs> I am throwing down my gauntlet. What do you think we can do with this knowledge about the evolving reading brain to help that next generation so that we give antidotes to the potential losses and new bridges to the next stages of intellectual development with mediums we can't even imagine this moment. Just like Socrates, who didn't want us to read, it's not about the particular of technology or a medium. It's about how we want to use our knowledge, the best of our knowledge, the best of our thoughts for the next generation. And so I'm going to leave you, not with a brain, but with Aristotle. <laughs> Oops, I guess I didn't. Where is Aristotle? Oh my God, he's gone. Oh, the wraith of Aristotle would have said, <laughs> ye gods, how did I lose everything, Andrew? Uh, this is always what happens to me. You see, technology hates me. <laughs> it's OK, it's OK. We have a love-hate affair. So what did Aristotle say about the good society? He said that it's one thing to have knowledge and productivity, and that's essential to a good society. It's another thing to have leisure or entertainment, and by that he means the arts, culture. But he said the thing that can go missing is contemplation. And so what I want to end with is I would like you to be participating in contemplation and reflection about what all this means, whether you agree or disagree with anything I say. Let us all think about what our particular contribution might be to going into the rest of the 21st century armed with knowledge, ready for more, but not losing the preciousness of what we have. Thank you so much. So you're not ending with anything, because we're not done with you yet. <laughs> um, we're we're going to think about your questions. I'm going to sneak in a couple quick ones for you first, Mary Ann. Tell us about this hacker lion. So you said he started hacking. What does that mean? What, what he did was he discovered that we had built in a camera that we didn't want anybody to turn on, because it would drain the battery. 
And he found it. He found a few other things. And he just, we, we do, to this moment, I could never do it. I could not do what he did. Um, the other question I want to ask you is about a term you used a lot. You talked about the circuit. Mm. So, so, so talk us through what that means. And there are different circuits. Is, th is that the, the first few hundred milliseconds? Is that what, you, what you're no, saying? What does the circuit mean? No, the circuit is the framework. Okay. The whole thing. It's like the scaffolding. It's a, if you will, it's a, a, a term that we use for everything that comes together in any circuit. So there could be a language circuit, a visual circuit, etc. There can be macro circuits and micro circuits. We're talking about reading as a macro circuit. So meaning that all of those pieces, all of those centers are used Within in reading, that. even though reading is, yeah. Is, Within yeah. reading, but they are also used in other potential systems. So it, at, at least two thirds of the reading circuit comes from parts of language. So when I talk about how the literate, the person who's literate changes their brain, they're changing the circuits within that, the connections with those parts. They have all kinds of new parts. All right, who has a question out there? Right here on the front. Um, so the dyslexia that your son's experience, you yes. gave that to them. It's a genetic trait that you passed on to them, correct? Yes. And, um, and I, I'm really curious, um, what's the difference in how the brain works um, for a culture that um, grows up in a language with a, with a pictographic, mm -hmm. as well as a photographic mm -hmm. script, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, a culture mm -hmm. that which has a script that's only a, mm -hmm. a phonographic. Okay. So, so could you uh, uh, kind of summarize two, the question there? Two, two totally different questions. One is about the genetics of dyslexia. And the, you, you have to understand dyslexia is a continuum of many things. So I myself am not dyslexic. Um, the father is not dyslexic. But the grandfathers on both sides that were undiagnosed but probable, not for sure, a great grandfather on the maternal side was this is this was uncovered in some of my research um, was in the history of Indiana as someone who went from a push cart <laughs> selling tobacco to becoming a millionaire and what was so interesting was that he could never do his ciphers or his letters and had to be read to he could never learn to read so it's fascinating that you know I may be the reason, but never mind. But it's not about I being the reason, it's about the throw of the die. So if my son will have children, more than likely there will be a strong propensity for the, my grandchildren to be dyslexic, okay? Okay, it's strong. Now, your other question is about pictographics versus, so here's what I want you to think about. Remember that brain circ the set of three brains, Chinese and Japanese? The reality is that the Japanese brain has both a pictographic system, kanji, and a syllabary, okay, kana. So what you have in Japanese is a brain that is able by fifth grade to go between types of writing systems. So right there you have a beautiful example of putting those things together. Chinese is not simply um, pictographic at all. It has a lot of interesting things, so it has more of that phoning-driven knowledge than people realize. But it's, by and large, much more visual, obviously, than ours. But if you ask me about alphabets, which you haven't, even our alphabets are different. So the French and the English are much closer than the German, the Dutch, and the Italian with far more regularity. They use other the same parts, but more so. And in English, we use more visual and attentional processes than the, than, than the Germans, the Dutch, the Serbo Croatians, and the Finns. The Finns are the best at everything. <laughs> but the Japanese were, oh, that was yeah, the, Okay, yes, so, so if you see the Japanese, this is kana, but kanji, so that Japanese brain is using both, okay? Okay, I think here and then there. Were you first? You and then you. Okay, please. So, you know, from what I understand, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned the Han about... Oh, Stanislaus de Han's right. work, yes. And um, from what I understand, that something he says is that, you know, 
like you say, which is our, our brain, it can repurpose all the yes. uh, uh, yes. uh, uh, circuitry to kind of be able to. But on the other hand, kind of the flip side of that mm -hmm. is that the written uh, mm -hmm. language is mm -hmm. basically adapted mm -hmm. to take advantage of that. So yes. Yes, there is. The, 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 the written language. Absolutely yeah. correct. So, so that's the niche. The one concept is neuronal recycling. Right. The other is the niche, that we have plasticity within limits. So it's not just writ large. Right. It's within limits. So right now, when, when I'm looking at that, mm -hmm. uh, of the written language that I'm seeing, this is basically was uh, produced by tools that you know, they didn't have that multimedia aspect that we have right mm -hmm. now, right? And so when we try to learn, say, even in, in visual screens, we mm -hmm. are just trying to learn these scripts where, where they were designed mm -hmm. before the technology we have now. Mm -hmm. So my question is, shouldn't, you know, could be, could mm -hmm. we actually design mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. written language or mm -hmm. writing language, I guess, in, that actually is much more Haptic, yeah, haptic it's kinesthetic. Around, it's much more mm -hmm. some other circuitry. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, mm -hmm. yes, what you were saying, which mm -hmm. is basically get to us to get to the people mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. not necessarily learn us to read that, mm -hmm. but more this. Mm -hmm. You have a beautiful question. It's got many parts. Part of it is the kinesthetic that I'll just say very quickly, people who really do some of the research on handwriting are showing us that these are connections between the motor and the language system that really deepen the process. They also slow it down a little bit at a time when slowing down is good. So this kinesthetic, haptic dimension is an additive thing. And you're quite interesting to me because so many of our children when they're doing this, they are taking their sticks. They're taking whatever they can, and they are actually adding the kinesthetic. We didn't do that. This is something that I think you are really right on the, uh, the cusp of things that we, we are beginning to learn what to do with this medium. And by no means do we know it, but it's a beautiful question. And so afterwards, I want to talk to you a little tiny bit more. Yes, your question. I'm extremely moved by the mm -hmm. global literacy project and so many other self efforts. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious mm -hmm. what resources you need or how mm -hmm. you can help if you don't mm -hmm. have the work to work with those flying institutions. Yes. That's wonderful. That this is my favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> so we're part of a group called Curious Learning, and we're trying to figure out ways how, and you can imagine, we wanted everything to be an open source platform. So simultaneously, we are helping places that are academic institutions like Rochester Institute or Tufts or MIT. We're, we're taking classes of students who are working to build apps according to our, our design. But we're also working with things like Games for Change. We're working with tech designers. We're hoping to interest people in developing apps for an open source platform that can be used. So that's one piece of our work. Another is, is trying to figure out how people who would ask that question of just who, who are you? Who, you know, not you, but you know, who asked that question? And how can we get people of like mind to find a place. We literally have people who are coming to us from various countries who are now going into places that we hadn't ever even thought of. Peru and Kenya are the two newest. People come to us and say, what can we do? And they have ideas and we work with them. But we're only in the beginning of this phase and I'll say one other thing. Um, we are interested in people trying to figure out from their knowledge base how that might contribute. And even though I'm not going to say where they work, one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk is that I could give my other son a lecture <laughs> without him knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the dearest things a mother can do. <laughs> and his girlfriend and the boy, I mean, the brother of the girlfriend, it's all wonderful. But, 
But they are interested in taking their knowledge and volunteering at some level. So I don't know what you do. I barely know what my son does. <laughs> it changes. <laughs> I'm in all in a good place. But you can use your own imaginations in ways that I can't about what you might do. And I can't tell you how excited it gets to feel that these tiny little efforts, and they are little. This is two little villages we began in Ethiopia, but we proved we could move, we could move so far. We haven't moved as far as we want. But I will tell you that the reality now is that Peter Diamandis, whom some of you know from the X Prize, who did the X Prize on you know, uh, space exploration and ocean reclamation, he saw these data and said, that's what's going to be the next X Prize. It's going to be on global learning. So there are teams that, from 40 countries that are trying to we'll whittle them down. And I'll, I'm just an advisor for them. I, I'm certainly not going to compete. But that was unbelievable. I couldn't have thought about what, you know, I can't think of those terms. I, I'm used to working with 20 to 200 children. The idea that we are trying to change millions, that's beyond me. I am, I am a farmer of kids. <laughs> 200 acres is about it. <laughs> but the world is our screen. The world is our, our place now. And each of us have something we can do. So thank you so much. That was my favorite question. Don't be dissuaded. I, I can have other favorites. <laughs> OK, next. All right. Oops. I think, I think uh, oh. we've got time for maybe just one more. I'm going to actually. What if I do it really fast instead of so? All right, well, we're, well let's, let's get. I, I, I've, I've, there's, a, there's actually, um, that's Laura Welcher from Long Now's Rosetta Project. Laura, did you have a question? Uh oh. I'm very interested in your global literacy program. I'd like yep. to talk to you more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is actually about um, uh, what we have given up mm -hmm. in acquiring literacy as a culture. Mm -hmm. And also what kids who are, and, mm -hmm. you know, I guess all of us who are immersed in this mm -hmm. digital environment of reading mm -hmm. might be gaining. Mm -hmm. So, with regard to things that we have potentially given up, mm -hmm. um, Yes. I, you know, yeah. He would probably. I, I agree with him on some of his points. But, They're um, important. Yeah. Like, uh, for example, rote memorization. Exactly. Really skill. Exactly. Like, how many of us have to actually write down our brochures and things? Right. Before. So we've given mm -hmm. up certain memory mm -hmm. abilities mm -hmm. uh, for the ability to mm -hmm. easily access things in books. Mm -hmm. And it changes also dynamics between people. Mm -hmm. um, the status of elders is mm -hmm. and Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely correct. Yes. Absolutely. You know what? You have asked a book. L listen. It is. It's beautiful. It's there's so many points that you have raised from Phaedrus, where Socrates absolutely said, "If you learn this, you will." It is a recipe. His quote: "It is a recipe not for memory, but for forgetting." That was one of the first things. That, but what he was really saying is that he worried about 
the youth's illusion of knowing something before they'd ever begun. Now remember, this is oral culture at its best. There is no argument that I would ever make that we can't have the highest form of intelligence in people who do not use literacy. Uh, is so Socrates, you know, I can almost say case study closed, but that's not really the point. The point that you're raising is the same one that I would have raised if I was talking to Socrates, which I do occasionally do, <laughs> arguing back and forth. But, but the point is that the same things you were saying about Socrates or that I would say is what I would say to myself to answer your question. We haven't even begun to understand, just as Socrates hadn't begun to understand what deep reading was possible with reading, how we could go beyond anything that he had imagined through reading. In the same token, I will say to you that I fully expect, if I, if I can just live a few more decades, to see totally different versions of literacy emerge. I look at that with the same kind of pleasure that I hope Socrates would if he would see now what we do. But I will also have to play my role, my Cassandra role, and say I will worry because I'm a reading worrier. So I am going to be worried about not what we gain. I think what we gain is going to be unbelievable. I mean, I just finished a little bit of reading about Mark Danieliski's new work, you know, familiar, you, you know, House of Lees, and what he is doing um, I don't know, Ryan, if you know this work, but what he said was that the act of writing thoughts is a miracle of alchemy. And this is the man who puts images and who is really exploding the word. He's exploding it. We will do that. But along the way, I must safeguard what I need to preserve. I'm actually far less worried about what we will gain than what we will lose. That's my role. But you, my dear, you're going to be the one who really helps figure out what we will gain. Together, we got the world. <laughs> That's it. All right. <laughs> you're going to stay right here. Yes. You're going to come up. Um, and I would like to give you, Marianne, a challenge coin, a long now challenge coin for, to thank you for, for speaking here. <laughs> it's a little ceremony we do for all of our speakers. One more big round of applause for Marianne, and please stick Thank around you. Thank you. and talk to her more. <laughs>